if we had a church full of people, there'd have been a lot of applause for that. That was wonderful. That was exciting. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Community Church of New Boston, New Hampshire, and our virtual service. I don't know if that's the right word for this or not, but anyway, welcome. It's nice to have you with us. Nice to have Sam back uh, this week after a week off. Uh, Karina, as you heard, is in force playing the piano. Paul's making this all possible, and we're glad to have you. A couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, we are looking for a COVID-19 reopening coordinator. That means we need somebody that helps us uh, figure out how to reopen the church safely, not only for worship, but also for the various groups that use this, especially our, our friends in these 12-step groups, uh, mainly AA. We have three different uh, AA groups that meet here, and they need to meet. So anyone that's interested in doing this, uh, it's a big volunteer assignment, but if you call me at 487-3643, I'll set you up with the right people and see if we can get uh, get you to help us out with that. That would be great. We still have a parishioner in need of an apartment or a place to live. Again, you can call me at 487-3643 if uh, you have some rooms you would rent or a little apartment. Uh, can't be very expensive because this lady doesn't have a lot of money, but she's a good lady and um, we're trying to help her find a place to move to. Session meets uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. Next Sunday, we will have communion. So have your communion uh, elements ready at home. And then I think we're going to have a Zoom coffee hour after church. Uh, we were talking about that this morning and with Sam's help and Paul's help. And I don't think Paul, poor Paul doesn't even know about this ship. I don't think <laughs> we were discussing it. And uh, okay. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll have some more details coming up uh, on that. So I guess we have one birthday I know about. We should sing happy birthday to Paul's mom. Had a birthday yesterday? And Mary Coon's birthday. That's right. Oh, okay. Paul told me that, Mary, but I, I'm going to tell you that uh, 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 your loving husband was also thinking about that Floyd. So he, uh, okay. So let's sing happy birthday to and and to Mary. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carol and Mary. Happy birthday to you. All right, happy birthday to two fine ladies. So we continue the service now with our morning prelude. We gather to worship the God who put the sun in the sky, 
by day and the moon by night, and then put all of us human beings here along with animals and plants, and gives us guidance on how to live together. We are still students and not very good ones sometimes. So we come to worship the God who loves us and to listen for his word, which helps us to love one another. And we begin to worship as we sing our opening hymn, which is number 571, and we're going to do verses 1 and 5. pray together. Gracious God, in the midst of trying times, we turn to you for comfort. We ask your presence as we worship, and we ask your presence in people's everyday lives as they struggle with the challenges we have, with illness, with loneliness, with losing loved ones. And we ask that we might be your disciples, doing what we can do as best we can to bring hope and comfort and love to one another. Be with us as we worship, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our first scripture reading is another vision of Isaiah's. Last week we talked about his call to be a prophet, which was a pretty spectacular vision. This is a, a long-term vision. We don't know that he saw this anywhere but in his mind, but here it is. It's uh, the first four verses of the uh, second chapter of the book of Isaiah. Here is the message which God gave to Isaiah, the son of Amoz, about Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain where the temple stands will be the highest one of all, towering above all the hills, Many nations will come streaming to it, and their people will say, Let us go up to the hill of the Lord, to the temple of Israel's God. He will teach us what he wants us to do. We will walk in the paths he has chosen, for the Lord's teaching comes from Jerusalem. From Zion he speaks to his people. He will settle disputes among great nations and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. And here ends our first reading. And now Sam has an anthem for us. When I 
That was uh, very special, very special. And that's what I want to talk about, the children's sermon, special people. And um, I'm joined by three of them right here. I mean, uh, Karina and Sam and Paul are just special folks. I want to talk about, a little bit with the kids, other kinds of special people who not only done a wonderful job of inspiring people as best we can here in our little town, but inspiring the world. And we lost one of them about a week ago, and I thought I would just talk a little bit about him. I'm going to hold up this picture. It'd be hard for Paul to focus on this, probably. But this is a picture of a man named John Lewis when he was 24 years old. He's being um, threatened by a policeman with a billy club. And do you know what he was doing? He's the man there in the suit, John Lewis. Young man, at that point working for and with Dr. Martin Luther King. And you know what the policeman is angry about? Because John Lewis was encouraging black people to sit at a lunch counter and have lunch sitting next to white people, which was against the law at that time, down in Tennessee where this picture was taken. All he wanted people to do was be able to eat at Morrison's cafeteria. And instead, the policeman was threatening to hit him with a club. John Lewis was a religious man. He was a Christian, went to seminary. I don't know if he was ever actually ordained, but he certainly did ministry in a big way by being one of the leaders all during what we call the civil rights movement back in the 60s. And then ever since then in Congress, he was elected to Congress. He was in Congress for about 27 years before he just died last weekend at the age of 80. John Lewis was a man of great courage and was one of those people who inspire us. In other words, make us want to do the right thing. And he took the teachings of Jesus, as did many others uh, at that time, and brought them to the streets and tried to bring them to Congress and tried to make us all better people. So we should know about John Lewis and Dr. King and some other folks I'll mention in my sermon this morning because they really were warriors for Christ. And they were warriors, because, but they didn't make war on anyone because you can't be a warrior for Jesus and be shooting people. They didn't do that. They let people hit them, and they didn't hit them back because they were practicing what our next scripture reading is all about. It's uh, our second scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Matthew uh, in the fifth chapter and beginning with the 38th verse. I'm going to read through verse 48. This is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is the speaker. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for for a tooth. But now I tell you, do not take revenge on someone who wrongs you. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, let him slap your left cheek too. If someone takes you to court to sue you for your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if one of the occupation troops, that would be the Romans, forces you to go with him for one mile, go with him for two miles. When someone asks you for something, give it to him. When someone wants to borrow something, lend it to him. You have heard that it was said, love your enemy, love your friends, and hate your enemies. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may become the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to shine on bad and good people alike, and gives rain to those who do good and to those who do evil. Why should God reward you if you love only the people who love you? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you speak only to your friends, have you done anything out of the ordinary? Even the pagans do that. You must be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Here ends our reading. Boy, those are uh, <laughs> those words are pretty, pretty powerful and pretty difficult. 
Well, you know, things are getting strange and expensive. You remember back in the days when your, if you had your tires seemed to be low in your car, you could pull into a gas station, uh, put air in your tires for free. Um, now it's like a dollar fifty uh, to fill your tires with air. You know why that is? Inflation. So anyway. <laughs> Well, I mean, the other day I was in somebody's house and um, they, they wanted to know if I wanted a cold drink. I, I said, that'd be, that'd be great. So, so I said, well, I can get it out of the refrigerator. And the lady uh, who had a little trouble walking said, oh, that would be very nice. And so I went out to the refrigerator. Then she called in from the living room. Hold on, hold on. Make sure you knock on the refrigerator door before you open it. I said, knock on the refrigerator door? Why should I do that? Well... Uh, inside, she said, there may be a salad dressing. So anyway. <laughs> Gee, this is a pretty good audience this morning. I mean, this is. <laughs> well, after those uh, uh, gems, uh, I would ask, the, ask a question, because I was having a discussion with somebody about this this week, um, and it wasn't about getting a drink out of the refrigerator. It was about what is the purpose uh, of a sermon. I mean, when a minister prepares a sermon, what is she or he attempting to do? Well, I can just speak for myself as to what I'm trying to do. Um, I think a sermon is an effort to bring some thoughts about God and about Jesus and about being a disciple in today's world. How do we serve God and Jesus in today's world? How do we serve Jesus and follow his teachings in 2020? Oh, I think we know as, as Christians that God loves us and is with us. We need to be reminded of that, I think. We all do sometimes because life can be pretty tough. But how does this belief then intersect with life in a very difficult time, a very difficult time. Uh, what do the, today's Bible readings uh, tell us? Well, the first one from Isaiah is a message of looking forward. It's a message of hope. Uh, Isaiah's vision tells us that someday, someday, the world will be a more peaceful place. People will stop fighting each other. Um, people will be at peace, uh, not only with each other on a small scale, uh, in a town or even in a house, but in the world. Um, there won't be any more war. Swords will be beaten into plowshares, so we'll be growing food instead of making weapons. Spears into pruning hooks. And nations will no longer spend an incredible amount of money getting ready to kill each other in the next war. There'll be no war anymore. That's basically what that vision says in Isaiah. And the, the key to it is when everybody starts uh, worshiping the same God, which is a God of love and a God of peace and a God who created everything and is there with us all the time. And then along came Jesus, and a lot of his teaching is found uh, in chapters 5 through 7 in the uh, Gospel of Matthew. There's also a similar version of the Sermon on the Mount in Luke. And he says in the section we read today that those who follow Jesus must practice nonviolence. Now, to borrow a term from some signs that used to be present at protests in the 1960s, make peace, not war, or make love, not war. That was another sign that uh, used to appear in those demonstrations. And that is really at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, these are wonderful thoughts, wonderful thoughts. Be peacemakers. If somebody, whether on the playground or in the courtroom, or on a battlefield, uh, hit you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. If 
one of the Roman soldiers forces you to carry something for him, which they used to routinely do, uh, for one mile, offer to carry it for a second mile. But those words take a lot of courage. Some people say, wow, that's, that's ridiculous. Somebody hits you, you're going to let them hit you. Hit. I've already lost one cheek, why am I going to lose the other one? If I let them hit you on the other side, that's common sense. Jesus wasn't preaching common sense. He was preaching God's will. But it's very hard. We've had leaders, great leaders, such as Gandhi, who took Jesus' teachings and tried to follow them, even though he was not a Christian. He was a Hindu. Martin Luther King, and the man I mentioned in the children's sermon, John Lewis, who died just last weekend at the age of 80. They took those teachings, and they made positive change through the practice expressed in those verses of Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48, uh, practice of nonviolence. Nonviolence. Now, I would suggest to you that practicing nonviolence takes even more courage than violence. Now, we honor, as we should, on Memorial Day and Veterans Day, people who have had the courage to serve in our military, especially during wartime. The courage called forth in combat is immense. I wasn't ever there, but I can't even imagine what it must be like. It's immense, the courage it takes to face people shooting at you and to try to shoot back and win a battle on the battlefield. But let's think for a minute about John Lewis. Um, as a young man, I think he was 15 when he first came and met uh, Martin Luther King. He was 24 in that picture I showed you. He was on the forefront with John, with uh, Martin Luther King and all those who marched with them in the 1960s trying to make our country a better place for everyone. But imagine the courage it takes to go out and march with a group of folks unarmed. They had no weapons. Martin Luther King once owned a revolver and when he began to be a spokesman for nonviolence, he had the revolver to protect his family because he was, uh, they were continually undergoing death threats. But he went to the police station and turned it in. He said, I can't in good conscience preach what I preach and own a gun. So here they were out in the street. Um, uh, they faced arrest, which often happened. They faced hoses, uh, fire hoses, to push them back from their march. They faced police people with clubs. They got slugged with fists. They were attacked by dogs. The people that were opposing them, many of them had guns. During that time, there was an incredible number of people killed uh, in the civil rights era. Black people, they blew up a Sunday, these, some people blew up a Sunday school room with three little children in it in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, Medgar Evers, a great hero of the civil rights movement, head of the NAACP in Mississippi, was assassinated. People were routinely hung by Ku Klux Klan members. And here was John Lewis practicing what Martin Luther King used as the motive, or the modus, I would say, modus operandi for the civil rights movement, Jesus' teachings of nonviolence. The message of nonviolence is you can't use any weapon to protect yourself except one. The weapon, and we never think of it as a weapon, is love, the love expressed through Jesus. John Lewis was a warrior, not a traditional one. He didn't wear a uniform. He didn't carry weapons. He didn't have any kind of training in terms of riflery or flying a plane to drop bombs on people or anything else of that sort. He was trained as best they could train somebody in not responding to the violence that was used against him. He was arrested over 40 times. Imagine what it's like to go to jail for simply 
asking for permission um, to eat lunch at a lunch counter or for asking for the right to go to a, a better school and to sit down in that school next to white boys and girls if you're a black person. He was a Christian warrior, arrested 40 times, beaten physically. Um, he twice got concussions from being clubbed by policemen, uh, once as a freedom rider, right, simply trying to integrate bus lines so that people who were black could take a bus, the same as white people, to get from one city to another. He was hauled off the bus and beaten by members of the Ku Klux Klan. And then at Selma, all they wanted, the black people there and the white people who joined them on the street, was to march through Selma over the bridge into Montgomery, Alabama, a few miles away, which was the state capital, to hold a rally for the right to vote. Isn't anything more fundamental to being an American than the right to vote? But instead, they were stopped by police the first time and beaten badly. John Lewis got a concussion. He was demeaned. He was spit on. He was disrespected. That's the least of his problems, probably. And he was threatened. And yet, John Lewis followed the teachings of Jesus. He loved his enemies. He loved his enemies. Now, how could that be? Well, notice I didn't say he liked his enemies. I said he loved his enemies. It's humanly impossible to like somebody who was doing to him what they were doing. But he loved them by not doing to them what they did to him. That's what Jesus meant when he said to love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you. The power of love can change lots of things can change individual lives. You want to see some examples of this? Go to an AA meeting sometime. Listen to the people that are sponsors and how they were helped in getting sober uh, because of the love of a sponsor and the support of a sponsor. Watch people now that are reaching out to those who have walked the walk and who helped them overcome a terrible addiction. And it can work on a bigger scale than just individual human beings. All of us at one time or another have been helped tremendously by someone's love. John Lewis and all those who joined Dr. Martin Luther King wanted to change the world, not just individual lives, but the world. And what did they use to do it? They used Jesus' teachings. There are many we could mention. Um, Jesus set an example of his own teaching. You know, when he was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter pulled out a sword. He was going to fight back against seeing his Lord arrested. Jesus said, Peter, put away your sword. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. And he submitted himself peacefully to the authorities, as evil as they were, and permitted himself to be crucified. He had the final word, he was resurrected, but imagine the courage it takes to do something like that. We've seen people like that in our time. I've mentioned Martin Luther King and John Lewis and all those who walk with them in the streets of the South and the North, because there were marches in Chicago and other places. Uh, those folks were greatly Christian warriors and very courageous. Mahatma Gandhi was a Hindu, but he won the freedom of his people from British rule in India by practicing Jesus' teachings of nonviolence. Nelson Mandela, I'm not sure what his religion was, but he certainly took the teachings of Jesus, uh, along with Bishop Desmond Tutu, another black man who was a black bishop, obviously a follower of Jesus in South Africa. And when black people finally took over control of South Africa, ending apartheid and ruled by a very small minority of white people. People thought there'd be bloodshed in South Africa. But Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu worked together, rallied people, black people, around a concept of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, not doing unto them what they'd done to you, 
and they rallied around support of a national team, a rugby team of the Union of South Africa, and they brought people together, and there was no huge bloodshed in South Africa. All of us are called to follow in their footsteps as best we can, to be movers of the world, and we have God's help when we practice his teachings, to be movers of the world in a direction of peace, in a direction of justice, in a direction of compassion, using the weapon of nonviolence, which is really using the practice of love. In our personal lives, it's love that defines who we are and makes the relationships that matter. The same thing is true on a bigger scale. Love can change the world. It has a long way to go, and it needs a lot of helpers. But today I would just close with a couple of quotes of other people about John Lewis. First of all, the, he's a great historian. You can see him on YouTube. He's written some wonderful books. His name is John Meacham. He's a Southerner, an Episcopalian, I believe. He said, John Lewis offered heroic humility. That's a great concept, heroic humility. There's Jesse Jackson, who I had the privilege of meeting a couple times. Uh, he was right there with Martin Luther King. You can see Jesse Jackson in the picture of Martin Luther King dying on the motel, uh, on the uh, little deck office motel room in Memphis in 1968. Jesse's right there. Another young man whose life was shaped by his relationship with Dr. King. He said this, good friend of John Lewis. He said, John Lewis is what patriotism and caring is like. That's what it looks like, he said. John Lewis sacrificed and personifies a New Testament prophet. Notice all in the Old Testament, we have a lot of great prophets. Isaiah is one of them that we read from this morning. He said he represents a New Testament prophet. And then there's a female minister, serves on a church staff in Atlanta, Georgia, Follow, followed into the ministry the footsteps of her father, Reverend Bernice King, daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King, said this about to, to the memory of John Lewis. She said, farewell, sir. You did indeed fight the good fight and get into a lot of good trouble. That's what John Lewis used to call doing the right thing, even though it got you in trouble, good trouble. Then Reverend King says this, you serve God and humanity well. Thank you. Take your rest. May we all find some inspiration in those good words about a very good person who I'm sure has heard the words, well done, my good and faithful servant, entered into rest that remains for you and for all my children. And let us sing our next hymn, which is number 578, verses 1 and 4. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the examples of so many people who have gone before us and some who are still with us who sacrifice for the good, who get into good trouble. This day we thank you for your servant, John Lewis, and for all those whose names we don't even know, who marched with him and with Dr. King to make our country better. We still have work to do. We ask for your spirit to inspire us, to give us the courage to respond with love and not hate, to give us the courage to respond with nonviolence and not violence. Be with us and help us in our own lives as we struggle with uncertainties and disappointments and fears and losses. Comfort us and let us know that you are with us. We offer our prayer in Jesus' name and we share the prayer which he taught us praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And now may the God of peace, who brought again for the dead our Lord Jesus the Christ, keep all of our hearts and minds constant in his faith and abiding love, now and forevermore. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.